Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Modern Business Operations. My name is Sagi. I'm the CEO and founder of Tonkin. And today I have the pleasure of hosting Shanti. Shanti is the Chief Legal Officer at JFrog. So pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I'm originally from Israel, and JFrog is, uh, I think, a, 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 an Israeli company um, originally as well. But um, uh, but other than that, you know, we know some people in common and we have uh, a shared network. But maybe, you know, for the listeners, uh, if you don't mind, kind of give a background of of your career and what you're doing today for, uh, for JFrog. Sure. Yeah. So like many lawyers, I started out in private practice for several years, and then I was lucky enough to go in-house quite junior in my career as a third year to a company located here in Silicon Valley, E-Trade. I was the first lawyer, even though they had a thousand people and were already public, a public broker dealer. So it was very unusual. But at the time, it was actually not that unusual because there were, this was before the rise of big legal departments in inside of companies. So they had a chief compliance officer, but no, no legal department. So I came in-house to report to him. And that was really my first taste of in-house legal. I loved it from the first uh, minute I was there because I just got to roll up my sleeves and learn about so many different areas of the business, not just uh, focusing on being a legal practitioner. So over time, I uh, went from job to job over time. I did take some time off, which meant that I needed to get my foot back in the door, uh, wow. which I did. So I've worked at quite a few companies. Uh, I've spent about eight years at Salesforce in various roles, both in Canada and here in the U.S. I've moved to Canada for about eight years. And uh, after that, I, I also worked at Autodesk, Twilio. I was the general counsel at Zendesk for the last three years before I came to JFrog, where I am now the chief legal officer. And JFrog, as you said, is an Israeli company, dual headquartered in Silicon Valley in Israel. And um, we are uh, a public company that is listed on the NASDAQ as well. Very impressive. This is you know, all of it, very no names. Um, and so congrats on all the success so far. So, you know, 20 years from attorney to, you know, through big corporations and through, um, you know, executive in, 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 in those public companies, what do you think, uh, how do you, how do you kind of summarize the uh, the industry of the legal, right? You, you know, you know, we talk a lot about in this in this podcast about operations, the growth of operations, the role of them, and uh, and I think, not surprisingly, a lot of time, you know, I ended up uh, have the pleasure to talk to folks within those type of departments that uh, you know, twenty years, thirty years ago, didn't have as much of, you know, of that sort of uh, rigor and, and, you know, compared to maybe sales and engineering that, you know, for a long time had kind of like strong methodologies and, and operational practices. And, uh, and I think legal is something that we've seen over and over again in the last decade, in the last 10 years, you know, how they kind of mature and, and, and become such an important in-house organization. And you mentioned it with E-Trade. So you know, let kind of how do you think about it? Like, how do you how do you think about the last twenty years? Yeah, I mean, the legal team has really morphed so much. The legal department has morphed so much during my career. Like I said, there was almost never a legal department, or if there was, there was maybe a general counsel who oversaw a lot of outside counsel work. Maybe gave their voice in a few key areas and mostly outsourced a lot of the work. But over time, really what we've seen is the insourcing of so much of the work and oversight by many different people. Some of the large technology companies in Silicon Valley have hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of lawyers at their disposal within the legal department. And even when you get to over 20 people, you need to understand what's working, what's not working, how do you measure how that, how that works? And what, are, what tools are you using to be efficient? How do you work within the company itself 
and how do you influence the company? You know, you're often when I hire lawyers who are more junior or who are even more senior, but come from law firms. I try not to. I try to hire a lot of people who have experience, but occasionally you do hire somebody coming from a law firm. And they'll ask me, how do I get my assignments? Because in law firms, you typically have a partner telling you what, what you need to work on. And then you finish the assignment, you get a new one. But in legal departments, you often don't get assignments that way. You might figure out that there's a problem on your own and then realize I need to do something about this. So, you know, you may get an assignment from a more senior lawyer. You may get something from, you know, hey, we're putting in this press release out. I need you to take a look at it. You need to figure out as a lawyer how to juggle what's important, how to prioritize what the business needs are and what the risks are. So really, the job has become uh, one of really understanding the business, how your risk review fits within the priorities of the of the company itself and where we're trying to go as a company, the objectives. And then how do you get people motivated in your team to work on the right things and to prioritize the work and do it in a manner that helps the company move forward? You know, every day when I'm talking to my team, there's always like the burning issues. What do we need to get done? What do we want to get done? How do we juggle those two things of, you know, where legal thinks it needs to spend its time and where the business wants you to spend the time so that you can bring in revenue generating deals, but also work on, you know, the vendor deals that other people want to have done, the reviews that need to be done, the updates, the programmatic things that have to be done, like with your privacy program, with your compliance program, working with the board, working with the management team. There's a whole myriad of things and you kind of have to map out what what's important and what i have seen over my career is the rise of legal operations when i first got to salesforce for example we had one legal operations person and what they were working on wasn't entirely clear i helped to step in from the commercial legal team at that time standpoint to understand you know where do we fit in how can we work on something to be more efficient for the business and for the for the commercial legal team working on the sales agreement. And over time, I've seen a much bigger rise of the import of the legal operations function and how they can make the legal department as a whole more effective, more efficient, more um, work, more concerned and able to review budgets in a, in a better way than in the past. I remember when I first was told, you know, we have to look at budgeting. Nobody really even understood what that meant. Like it wasn't very clear to the legal team. And, you know, I think over time, over the last 10 years, open, it's been much more open dialogue with outside counsel around uh, fixed fees, alternative fee arrangements, how to work as partnerships with them to make it more um, predictable for the, for the CFO and the financial team. Because, you know, the last thing you want to do is surprise the finance team with uh, un unplanned legal expenses, which does happen from time to time. So you need to figure out how best to adjust to those areas. And I think the, you know, you kind of touched on a few points there that I was curious about. Um, but I think when, when we do look at the last um, 10 years has been multiple sort of like uh, global events call it, right, that obviously impacted a lot of the industries and a lot of parts of an industry. And I think, you know, some of the things, um, even within, even in legal, with, where it's even more common to have an outside counsel and inside counsel, and so like the, 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 the balance between the two, like, what do you, what do you, what do you keep inside? What do you put outside, right? Where the same happened in other departments that are less it's less trivial for, right? You know, when everything turned remote, people are like, okay, if it turned remote, maybe I'll outsource more things. Maybe I'll outsource some of the engineering, maybe I'll outsource some of the, some of the sales or SDRs or whatever. And in some areas, it works better than others. And, you know, we're not going to get into that. But kind of what I find interesting is um, law and, 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 and legal in, in general is such a, such a human-centric 
profession and some of those um you know not to mention about the remote but also later with so sort of like the financial slowdown or whatever you want to call it something different uh you know the rise of ai and technology there's such a such a uh thrill sometimes when i spoke when i speak with with folks from legal departments like a, a, a pivotal moment of you know how do we build our organization to the next five years or to the next 10 years like how, how do you think about that you know all the things that you touched on are really interesting i think from the perspective of um, who does what internally versus externally, you have to really consider, you know, where is the business located and where are you advising people? Because if we're talking about having to do a bunch of advice for somebody in France, you know, my team here in the U.S. isn't going to be able to answer all the questions under French law. We're going to have to get outside counsel located in France who can help us with that or somebody who has the French bar. Um, so, you know, those are some of the calculations. I think there was a movement for a little while to um, outsource or to put people overseas in low cost jurisdictions that can handle a lot of the work that are repeatable. And I actually did something similar to that and, and wrote an article about that. Uh, but now I think maybe we, there's lots of a need for that because maybe we'll be able to use AI and other tools to do some of those things, you know, and enabling. Uh, doing some repeatable questionnaire reviews, things like that. We often get in quest privacy questionnaires, security questionnaires, and why can't you train an AI on your data as long as it's secure and confidential to be able to answer those questions on a repeatable basis versus having it shifted to a low-cost location. So I think that there is this shift going on right now in the legal team, just like in other teams around, you know, where the best place is to do the work and how the best way is to do the work. Um, number one. Number two, you know, often people will say, oh, I need a headcount because, you know, we're going to get this deal done. We're all going to sit in a room together until we hammer out all the deal points. And that's not realistic to how deals get done today. Nobody flies to London and all sits in a room and figures it out. And even if we were all there, We'd probably have to call somebody in different places to get a response to how the business is done on a specific point around the product or finance or something like that. So you can't get usually can't get all the decision makers in a multinational company in one room to get a deal done. So it's more about how can you understand and have all the right background information and constant updating for the team to to understand what the right you know, what the product does, how it functions, how they can explain it, you know, so having regular updates for for the legal team on, you know, the functionality of the product, how the releases work, having somebody on the team dedicated to product and understanding, you know, systematic allowances that you make for fallbacks or otherwise. Um, and what tools can you use for that? You know, are there AI tools today that you can use to do a first review of contracts versus a junior lawyer doing that? I think there are, there are starting to be those uh, opportunities. I think they're nascent. And the problem that I've seen with some of them is that, um, you know, if it's a startup company and you're working with a, a large public company, my my um, procurement team isn't going to allow us to use it unless it's got, you know, SOC 2 and all the different ISO certifications. And so that's where I often run into trouble where I want to be pragmatic and use really innovative tools, but they're just not ready for use yet for a large company. So that's where there's still, I think, a little bit of a disconnect, especially with the use of some of the newer AI tools. And how how do you you know some of the backlash sometimes I've I, I've heard is the team itself might be um, uh, skeptical you know to choose a you know a, a soft word but you know sort of skeptical about uh, technology or 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 change into the organizational priorities of you know uh, some things you mentioned. How do you how do you manage being pragmatic, being like thinking about okay, offshore was trying to solve a problem that might have a, uh, a better from like a cost perspective or from a scale perspective for us with with technology. 
there is a different aspect though of you know when when people comes in and where people are you know might be a little bit more skeptical how, how do you think about how do you handle those do you have the have you meant have you seen this internally how, how do you think about yeah i mean along? change management is very difficult right people get used to a certain way of doing things even if it's very inefficient even if it's not not working well and it can't scale they're just used to it and they'll say but this is how we do it and that's how we always do it so i always come in to a company and want to listen first about what's working what's not working not from just the not just from my peers not just from other people within the company but for my own team what do you find problematic what do you see isn't working what would you do to change it yeah you might have worked somewhere else as well and so then i try to take the approach of okay so here's what it looks like the priority should be and here's how we're going to fix it but i need all of you to come along with me to help and sometimes people will say I'm not up for that. I don't want to, I, I don't like this too fast of a change or too much, or I don't like the way it's going. Mm-hmm. And you'll always have some attrition based on changes that you make. But I think a lot of times people get on board because they're excited to see, they see that it hasn't been working. And what I always try to tell people, um, one of the best things I ever learned about was beginner's mind. You know, Mark Benioff would talk all the time about, you know, seeing something from a beginner's perspective, a child's perspective. You know, when you walk into a company, you often say, why are they doing it that way? That seems really ridiculous. But over time, you get so used to doing it that way that you just forget that it was inefficient. And now you think, well, this is how it has to work. So what's been really interesting for me is going to different big companies and seeing that they're very different in some of the ways that they, you know, get approvals done, get deals done, have deal deaths or don't. Um, and different things that they give and take on. And so you can understand after, you know, if you work at one company only, you think that's the only way that you can get an approval or have things done in a certain way. But when you've gone to different companies, you realize there's a lot of different perspectives out there and you have to kind of determine what works in the company that you're in today and not necessarily what worked, you know, in a prior company. And speaking speaking of that, you know, I think, Another area where you also mentioned when you talked about some of the examples, uh, both from like dear room and how sales is done, how product is done. Um, but this is an area I've seen, you know, over and over again, kind of curious on your experience and how that changed over the last, you know, during your career, the last couple decades, what, uh, as feels like stayed the same is that silos of departments and, and really where, um, where I'm, where I'm excited about, you know, some of those technology, latest technology, innovation methodologies too, by the way, um, is, is where, you know, group of people from multiple departments start to come together and sort of like first literally just recognizing the fact that they have different priorities and different you know, roles within it, uh, but somehow uh, also, you know, being able to, uh, to align it. And, 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 you know, when you think about that legal operators, um, legal operations teams, you know, growing as a function, uh, how much, how much that uh, department silos or breaking those silos is, is part of this, do you think? I think it's always uh, an issue as a, as a company grows, it's very normal that you'll have these silos. And one of the most important aspects of the role of, of chief legal officer or general counsel is really understanding where legal often will bring together the review of these types of things. Because if you're dealing with customer contracts where a lot of these things arise, a customer is asking for a specific type of review or audit or do you do this kind of um, background check or otherwise, you know, you end up having to be an expert in how the company operates in all different areas. And so legal can often be the one to, you know, go through these different types of issues with people and help break down the silos because it, often it's not just one one group of individuals and one, you know, in IT, for example, or just in HR that has to decide, can we do a background check like that? 
often it might even be the legal team that will be advising them not to do something. And so I can't tell you how many times I've been told, no, we have to get legal's approval. And I'm like, I have the legal department. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, oh, but your team set this this rigid rule up. And I said, okay, well, let's look at that, you know, because maybe it's not serving us anymore. And so I think that, you know, it's often the case where you'll be told by somebody, well, this is how we do it again. It's like, well, maybe that doesn't work anymore. Um, another good example is, you know, we're uh, often I come into a company and we'll be trying to set up a contract lifecycle management system and CLMs tool. And I've had a couple of times where I've come in and the team is the, the legal team has said, well, we just couldn't wait for everybody else to decide. So we just picked a system. And then it becomes a siloed system only for the legal team. The, the legal team puts, puts uh, and creates it as a repository and it serves some purpose for the legal team, but it doesn't work for the sales team. They don't have access. They don't do their quote to cash system in there. And then it becomes a, a worse silo. And so really, even when you're implementing a tool that can be used across functions, you really need to have all those functions have input into the tool. And even though it will take longer, ultimately to choose the tool, to negotiate compromises around who wants what, it will become a better process in the long run if you do the work up front rather than trying to implement something and then back end into it later. You'll end up ripping the tool out that you purchased because it doesn't work. If if they don't use it, right, you're not you're not getting any of the value, and and uh, and I I, I completely agree. Um, the, the the amount of times where, um, you know, departments will have issues with their process and how it's connected to other departments, but then the way they're trying to solve it is by still solving it within their department, versus you know working with those other departments to understand how how those goes about that. And it's interesting, not only from a tools perspective, you know, you spoke of Mark Benioff, but like there's, there's, there's companies, you know, organization structure that is interesting too. Sometimes, you know, people are building those like mini kind of companies with like a GM or like, you know, into trying to, you know, create organizational structure that is more aligned with the business, but then there's even harder, you know, ways to create alignment across, let's say, you know, take the legal example across all the different legal teams that are across those different, uh, platforms, although, you know, legal would, might be an even a shared service. So it's really get complicated when you, when you're trying to think about it. So, you, you know, I'll kind of bring this up because wh what would be like a good way for people to think from your experience? To think about approaching some of those problems, right? Say you're, say you're a leader um, in a legal department, or you know uh, other uh, similar, you know, s scenarios with with mid to small enterprise to large enterprises. How how do you go about pushing for some of those ideas for some of those change? You know, you mentioned some of people in your team might say, "Hey, you know, I've seen this in the past that works good." What is this? What is uh, a what makes you listen and say, you know what, actually, let's start mobilize and make a change here. Uh, what kind of, what works? So a couple of things. First, I think it's really important to, you know, take a look and listen, like I said, to what people are complaining about, you know, legal is a blocker here. This is a problem. This takes too long. And then, you know, often I'll get from the legal team. Well, no, actually, it's working fine from our perspective. So there's a disconnect. I'm trying to understand where that disconnect occurs. Uh, and then, you know, understanding the priorities for each of the departments. What are, you know, what did the CEO tell the CIO is really important to him to, to implement? And then where, where do we connect the dots between my department and his department or her department? And then what are the disconnects there? Like what you know, often there's interlocking priorities that we need to get aligned on. You know, so maybe my CLM system isn't important to the CIO. So how can I get it on the radar and make it important to it so that, you know, if you have two of the seven or eight or 10 or whatever it is on the executive leadership team saying we need something, you're more likely to get somebody to listen, especially if it's, you know, in the revenue generation area. 
where you're going to show it, you can add value, especially if it's a larger project like that. And so I think it's about how you can influence people in areas that make sense to the business, um, where you can find alignment. And I think, you know, making clear that legal is a partner is always important and bringing legal in early because often people will say, you know, oh, legal said I couldn't do something and I was already so far along in my project. And if I would have known, I wouldn't have done this project. But, you know, from my perspective, it's like, well, you should bring legal in at the beginning and tell me what your objective is rather than telling me over here at the towards the end. Can I send this email or can I not send the email? I might say, no, you can't send the email. And you think, oh, that that's it. My whole project is ruined. Whereas you could have told me at the very beginning what your objective was. And I might have said, well, emails won't work in this country because you need double opt in. Instead of doing an email campaign, I would approach it this way, which I've seen be successful in other companies. And so making legal part of the discussion at the outset is better. And it also helps align everybody in the in the, you know, company. I think that's actually this is great. Uh, practical advice too is you know where you know be available but also push people to bring you in earlier right and and I think you know the, just the first part you also mentioned with through the CIO and, and the rest of the executive eyes I think a lot of people when they think about their challenge and and they first go to the solution already so they come and say hey I, I have a solution and they're like wait what is the challenge but also understanding you know really work hard to look from the eyes of the rest of the organization. And you want, you gave the CLM so we can stay without for a second. Well, like you want a, a new CLM. Why should the CRO care? Why should the CFO care? If, why, why should the CIO care? Can you find the reasons why they would care? Can you get a couple of them to agree that this is a priority? Uh, that would, that would not only make the case, it also Go back to the previous part of the conversation. The course departmental part is already going to have buy-in because they were part of the process. But now also you kind of lead, leading them into be also part of that earlier in the in the cycle. Because uh, now you, you're essentially saying, I'm doing it for you, not only for me, so we can all kind of work better together. So um, yeah, Exactly. Pretty- and talking about things is like helping revenue generation in a way that you can then quantify later. It is important. You know, you can't just make the statements and arguments, but you actually have to figure out what the KPIs are going to be to show how you're going to add value later with the system. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, not only for buying, uh, we're talking about tools and software, but it's not only about that. It's any change you want to make. You know, people understand the concept of a business case or an ROI case, uh, but they can get, in my opinion, opinion, they can get too stuck on the numbers. The numbers are critical. You have to have some of those metrics to your point in the KPIs, but what, like, what is the narrative, like, what is the narrative? What is the logic, um, that, that, that would make that numbers make sense. And, and, and in fact, if you do spend time on it early, then you, that's a reason for you to bring legal early or to bring, you know, procurement early or to bring it early and say, really like, this is what I'm trying to solve. This is what I think the issue is between us departments or, or with, with our customers or with our suppliers or with our partners and outside console, whatever it is. And this is how I'm thinking about solving this. I want to get your input. And then like, okay, so now I have a solution proposed and so on and so forth. And again, that solution doesn't have to be tech. It can be like, we should change our, the way we, you know, hire making things up, but. It's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Definitely. Um, well, I, I, I think this is, uh, I think this has been great, uh, and very informative, honestly. And I think, uh, mm-hmm. it's a very interesting perspective to hear to kind of through the different, uh, uh, companies you've, you've, you've worked in. If you, um, if you don't mind, like, I'd like to ask, you know, what is a, what is a, good personal advice that you got, you know, in your career that, that you feel like it's worth uh, paying, paying forward. 
I think there's two, I would say. One is, you know, really be a good listener because you often, I it, when I was more junior in my career, I like to come in and talk a lot and, and explain what I knew. But really listening and understanding what other people have to say is really helpful, especially at, when you first come in somewhere. Uh, and then the second is never waste a good crisis. So inevitably in legal, you'll come up with some disaster that you think, oh, this is terrible. That's the pl- that's the point where you say, OK, I've been telling you a long time that we're going to get sued. Now here's the things that we need to do to change. So use that as a catalyst for whatever thing that you've been trying to get accomplished that wasn't able to up till now. I, I honestly love that. Uh, the first one, obviously, you know, and we've talked about it through, but the, the second one is such a good point, especially because it's so hard to change people, right? And so if change already happened to you, so if there's already a crisis, something already hit the fence, like that is the moment in which uh, instead of saying, I told you so, say like, okay, I think I know why this happened, you know, and I think I know how we can prevent it from happening again. And you'll get, you'll get the, 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 all the, all the attention at that point. So, uh, that's awesome. Well, if anyone wants to, you know, continue to gig with you on this, where, where can they find you? Is it, is it LinkedIn? Is it X? Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. I also have my own website, shantiericrew.com, that I'm an aspiring memoirist. So I've been starting to blog and uh, you can find me there as well. Oh, that's perfect. So we'll definitely check it out. Uh, thank you, Shanti, so much. That was awesome. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you.